Wanna come in and sing some blues? No thanks, Tosh. There's something about those songs. They depress me. Hey, you're listening to 200 Proof Gospel, the podcast. Put that back right up there a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Craig D'Onofrio. I am Pastor Troy New Year. Yep. We're flying, uh, well, I guess since you're here, I'm not flying solo. Uh, We we are flying solo. (laughs) We're we're flying flying duo? Duo. Yes. Yes. I think actually... Most planes have like a pilot and a co-pilot, so we're we're probably uh, we're, we're probably kind of normal if we're going to make this a plane equivalency kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're just saying we're missing the other two master distillers. That's yes, all. yes, yes, yes. We are Troy yeah. and and Mark. Uh, uh, no, Troy, I, uh, Timothy, Troy. and Mark could not be with us today. Timothy was at uh, some uh, district conference thing or something. Thing. And Mark yeah. just uh, who knows. He he wandered know. off and we've we've lost track of him. Maybe he'll call in. I I did you check lost and found? He might have I, been there. I did not. <laughs> well, maybe we should check after the show. We'll go check lost and found. Maybe he's there waiting for us. I <laughs> told him, you know, if we get separated, meet at the castle. That's but <laughs> Anyway, be sure to subscribe to this program on iTunes, Spreaker, Podbean. Um, we're on Spotify. We're all over the place. Tune in radio. You name it, we're there. Check us out Friday mornings on Pirate Christian Radio. Uh, get the app for iOS and or Android. Maybe. Are there any devices that run both? I have no idea. Get both. Get an app for both if you have. There anyway. you go. Do that. And you can email us also at 200proofgospel at gmail.com. Um, and don't forget, you can also listen on your Alexa device. Oh, yes. Yeah. Alexa, play 200 Proof Gospel. Now, if your Alexa is doing that, you're probably cursing me. Awesome. <laughs> and, it, and it's stuck in a permanent loop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, let's see. I think that's about all of the housekeeping stuff there. And uh, we haven't recorded for a couple of weeks, so no, it's, no, it's not you and I. Uh, you and Mark did a show here. Good, good, good to see you face to face, my it's, friend. It's good. Well, thank yeah, you. It's oh, good well to see a you. Yeah. There you go. Very good. Uh, shall we do the toast? We shall do a toast. All right. Let us do the toast. Raise your glass, your smart device, whatever. Got ice in there. Whatever. And uh, here we go. To that washing that declares us blameless and pure, that will cause us to stand without shame on that day. Amen. Amen. There we go. Amen. Did that seem a little more reverby than normal to you? Um, kind of like it was in a cave or something? Maybe a beer cave? Should somewhere? be. Yeah, could. Maybe. Yeah. I, I guess I really did not notice. Yeah. But I like it. <laughs> just, just curious. So uh, we got together, and as usual... Troy's always wondering, what are we going to talk about? And I'm never really concerned about it uh, because we seem to have no problem talking about whatever anyway. Yeah, well, so, you know, I just have this fear of being looking like a fool on uh, international I, internet radio. I have no fear of such things because <sighs> I know I'm a fool. So <laughs> okay, it's, well, it's good. Just... <laughs> so, so you're saying I just haven't, haven't had that proven conclusively to me. Right. Just yet, uh, right? A, a Craig opens his mouth and dispels all doubt. That's, <laughs> I think that's in Proverbs. Uh, so anyway, you, you started going, uh, you, you started talking about the uh, concreteness of the gospel. Is that is that a fair way of saying it? The con- sure. Con- yeah. Concreteness yes. of the gospel. Yeah, we should call it the uh, the gospel in concreto or something like that. Ooh, yeah. Give that it a real sounds, fancy Latin. Sounds sort Latin of sounding. Yeah. Sounds, sounds like uh, it's got gravitas because. Ooh. Ooh, there's another one. Yeah, because concrete's heavy, so gravity really likes it. That's kind of my guess. That makes sense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you apparently have been uh, doing some work on Daniel 4 in particular. I, I have, yeah. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, it's a Nebuchadnezzar, as a matter of Nebuchadnezzar. fact. Nebuchadnezzar. I'm, yeah. I'm just looking at it here. I'm wondering how we could slaughter his name better. 
Nebuched, oh. Nebuched ne- Nezar. In the uh, Septuagint, it's like Nabod Kadnuzer or something Ooh, like that's that. That's a good it's, one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Remember studying some really interesting names in Isaiah and stuff also. But, oh, really? So, wow. anyway, tell the story briefly of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. I love never, it. never land. <laughs> and <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, never land. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, what, what, what is your point here? So, what? what? For those who Boy. those of those of our listeners yeah. who are biblically illiterate, who was Nebuchadnezzar and what's the story here? Oh, you want the whole story? Daniel four. Well, Nebu- okay. Briefly, do Nebuchadnezzar the, uh, goes down in the biblical record as being the king of Babylon who destroys Jerusalem, the temple, and carts off the people into exile. Well, that happened more than once. In so. in in a big like decisive way. <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, I'm just thinking, like, time and time again, the Israelites were, like, taken into captivity. And yeah, but this is off. the big one. Okay. This is, like, the really big one. All right. So not, like, little captivities and... Or, okay, now we're off topic. Okay, so hold on. Well, no, this is all part of the narrative. You know, you got to set the it narrative. It is, okay. You got to set the stage. Okay, well, this is, this is, like, the one, though. It's, like, the huge defining moment of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Okay. Anyway, so moving on. Shall we move on to the actual point? Yes, moving along. Okay, moving along. Daniel, however, then, so the book of Daniel, especially in Daniel chapter 4, um, Daniel chapter 4 is a letter written by Nebuchadnezzar himself relating a story in which uh, he has a dream. Uh, he seeks for the interpretation of that dream. Daniel gives him the interpretation of that dream. Uh, And the interpretation basically is this, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are too proud, Uh, you look too much upon yourself, and uh, God will strike you and humble you and lower you. And uh, basically, uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes insane for about seven years. Uh, I think there's a technical term, lycanthropy. Uh, he uh, he b- basically believes he's an animal. Oh, yeah, yeah. He uh, he went stark raving, howling mad. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty awesome, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Was he like out eating grass or something? Crazy? Exactly. Yeah yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, his hair was like the hair of an eagle or like eagle's uh, feathers. And his, uh, he, his, his, he went about on all fours. His fingernails and toenails grew so long they looked like claws. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Boy, it wasn't right in his head. Yeah, you know, I, I'm this far off topic right now at this moment. Let me just say that it's really fascinating that some of the, uh, the early church uh, commentators on this topic actually believe that he did, in fact, actually change to an animal. Ooh. It was metamorphosized. Werewolf-like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, I like it. Anyway, uh, I don't believe that, but it's fascinating tidbit. Well, I'm but, a big fan of Blade, you know. <laughs> I loved that movie back in the early 90s. That was Vampires? It? Blade, but then there were the other guys who were the Lycans. Oh, no, you're thinking of... Wasn't that Blade? Underworld. 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 Uh, yeah. I got them all blurred. Which is another vampire movie. Yeah, you're right. That yes. was Underworld. Underworld. Oh, man. With, You've exposed uh... my shame. See, once again, I look like a fool. You made me look like a fool by telling me the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I shall avoid telling you the truth in the future. Don't tell me the truth. I look like a fool. So where were we? Uh, somewhere in Parma. This is where I live. Uh, oh, no, Babylon. Oh, yeah, 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 Babylon, yeah. yeah. How, so, howling uh, at the moon, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's howling at the moon. Uh, at the end of his appointed time, he, uh, he lifts his eyes to heaven, confesses that he is humbled before, as he says, the Most High God, and, uh, and then turns around, receives his sanity, receives his kingdom back, and writes this letter. Okay. Okay. So the question at hand is, if he humbled himself before the Most High God, the Most High God... The Most High God. Now, does this indicate that there are lesser gods? Uh, Well, you know, it depends. Lou really doesn't want to leave you alone. Uh, No, no. uh, Yeah, for our listeners, I'm playing with Craig's dog right now, so... (laughs) Hi, Lou. Troy's a little allergic to him, and of course, you know... Cats and dogs gravitate naturally toward those who should not be petting them. Yeah, as, as, that's cool. But I am petting him, and that's his deal. Yeah, so you're and, encouraging the bad behavior well, at this yeah, point. Because he's going to bite my hand off if I don't. Uh, he's wondering in the other no, room. Bye, Lou. Okay. Maybe we should close the door behind him. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, now he's back. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Lou Knazer was. Uh... <laughs> so so we were we were talking before we were so rudely interrupted by the Labrador that uh, Nebuchadnezzar says that he has been most humbled by the most or humbled by the most high God, which Troy, you you take this to be as uh, he is still holding to there being multiple gods. Ooh, well, uh, okay, not that necessarily, because uh, it's really fascinating that that the uh, the words most high God uh, is actually a title. So I, I don't think it, even in the Aramaic, it's not an adjective. He's not speaking of the highest God. Right. He's speaking of Most High God in, in the same way that the rest of the Old Testament uses that as a title for what we know to be the one true God. Okay. But, but the other stuff is that uh, he does speak of uh, Daniel, who is named Belteshazzar, right. and, and Nebuchadnezzar says he's named that after my God. Hmm. So he does seem to actually indicate that he does believe in other gods. I still. did not remember that part, uh, that, that he named Daniel after his his own god. Yeah, but, yeah. But Daniel was not a follower of his god. Daniel was a follower well, yeah, of the but, most high god. Uh, he was, yes, but... Uh, Boy, that's confusing. You know, when you're exiled into a foreign land and put in the service of a pagan king... They you call are, you what they want. They call you what yeah. you want, yeah. Yeah, it's like, where does the 800-pound gorilla sit? Yeah, wherever he, wherever wants. he wants. So they call you whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, yes. yes. If you protest, you might get whipped. Yes. So oh, well, for that matter, while we're in the book of Daniel, yeah. yeah, who are Daniel's three friends? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? No, they're not. Who are they? Those are their Babylonian names. Oh, uh, Yeah, uh, me wait, either. Wait, wait, their their real names were uh, Shlomo, no, it was... um, Jaime, <laughs> you are... <laughs> and um, I think Bob was the yeah, third one, Bob, if I'm not mistaken. Classic Jewish name from the Old Testament, Bob. <laughs> Bob, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, you know, I guess, dude, I'm just going everywhere today. I apologize. No, it's what we. But do. yeah, this, yeah. This is this is quality radio. <laughs> so, that's it's so, yeah. really about the ADD. Yeah. So uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all named after uh, other of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's gods as well. I did not know that. Uh, I'm sure that they are. Now I got to look yeah, it up. I'm not doubting you because, oh, like I said, I haven't opened Daniel in a long oh, time. Boy. So yeah. But uh, but uh, Daniel, we remember his name as his Jewish name, but for some reason, the king actually names him as Belteshazzar. So yes, yeah. I do remember that much, but I didn't remember that he was named after God. Well, I'll take your word for it, though. Yeah, I'm so, going to look it up now. And so Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, yeah, uh, humiliated. One would say, yeah, for like seven years he just goes apey, and and then. He comes back around, and he writes this letter. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, beforehand, we, we were talking about this, uh, beginning of, of Daniel 4, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwelt on the earth. So this this is kind of some good news for all people, not just for the Jews, but for all people. Yeah, yeah, that's an important uh, thing to add there, too. Yeah, so the, the gospel... If, if you will, if we're going to be analogous with this, uh, we find that the, this this good news is not, you know, for, for the Jew first, then for the Gentile, as, as the New yeah. Testament, as Scripture tells us. And so we've got Nebuchadnezzar basically talking about the Most High God to everyone. To everyone. Yeah. To everyone. Yeah. And what he says, can, let me read it, actually. Sure. Uh, uh, Daniel chapter 4. Verses 34 and following. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the world are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say his hand or say to him, What have you done? And at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. 
So the, how, how this, is it? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> how is it that the the all powerful King of Heaven uh, did not become the sole God of the people of Babylon? Do you have any any thoughts on that? Ooh. How what how oh how he they. I mean, what, but, why, I'm just going to stutter for about 10 minutes. How, what? How, how is it that Nebuchadnezzar says such things, and yet we know that the Babylonians still had other gods even after this? Oh, well, man, there's so many ways to answer that. Uh, okay, you know what? Let, let's, let's get at one thing here first, though, right? <laughs> it's okay to say, I don't know. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar uh, ne- Nebuchadnezzar Neverland. <sighs> you know, the king of Babylon. <laughs> let's just call him Neb. Uh, Ned, sure. good old Ned, yeah. yeah. Um, and Ned demonstrates a fear of God. Okay. Okay. So we look at the book of Deuteronomy, and you know what are we expected to do? We are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Or that's actually the small catechism, yeah, isn't it? Is, yeah. But he borrows the language from Deuteronomy. Uh, trust me on that. Um. So Nebuchadnezzar demonstrates a fear of God. He understands that God is mighty and that Nebuchadnezzar before him is humble. But nowhere in this chapter do we get an indication that Nebuchadnezzar looks to God for all that is good. Hmm. He does not, uh, in that sense, then, he does not love God. So he fears the might and power of God. Yeah, and, and in the classic sense of that word that we always mean, like has an enormously healthy respect for, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So as I teach my kids in confirmation class, we go through that, what does it mean to fear, love, and trust God above all things? Sure. And that fear is the majesty of God. God is all Mm -hmm. everything. I mean, He's all powerful, He's all righteous, He's all knowing, He's Mm -hmm. all all these things, and He can do whatever He wants, however He wants, and He would be well within His rights to smash us like bugs because we're rebellious little brats. Yes. So we fear God because He is God. He's powerful, and He can do whatever He wants. And so mm-hmm. we have this healthy fear of God, um, much like you would fear um, someone who is uh, a, a bouncer at a nightclub who could toss you out on your ear. You know, you have a healthy fear for this guy because he's much stronger than you, assuming that he is. Assuming, I think it's probably a safe. Although I did bet. see Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze, he wasn't very big, but he could really fight in the movie, which I don't think Patrick Swayze could really fight like his character in the movie. But that's a whole other story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to recall the movie. He was a bouncer. Okay. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. Like it's all about Patrick Swayze being tough. The old grizzled, gray-haired guy that was his buddy. I yeah, forget, yeah. Uh, Sam. Um, Sam. Sam. Um, Adams. Email us. I don't know. Email us. <coughs> For those yeah. of you who are Roadhouse fans, you can you can tell us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those of you who are into vintage movies, I, right? I should yeah. say for those of you who are what? a Roadhouse fan, singular. <laughs> <laughs> the one of you. So um, Nebuchadnezzar. So yeah. So in the fear of God, and actually, you know what's really cool? He speaks about God accurately in that sense. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. I mean, and Nebuchadnezzar understands that God is mighty and that God is eternal. Okay. But still, I mean, it's one thing entirely, right, to say that God is sovereign, that God is mighty. It's another thing yet to say that God is good and that he is good to me and good for me. Yes, that that for me is always the big part. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so he says in verse 37, now I praise and extol and honor this king of heaven for all his works are right and all his ways are just. Mm-hmm. And those who walk in pride he is able to humble. <clears throat> is is yeah. there I, I don't know. I I kind of get the sense that he doesn't, in the Old Testament, it doesn't come up very often, this idea of imputation, that his righteousness, mm-hmm. his works, and all of this, those things that are just are credited to Nebuchadnezzar's account. It's more like, you get the feeling maybe he was just taken to the woodshed for seven years and beaten senseless until he 
came to his senses until he repented. Yeah. Right? Sure. You know, so and, that, and, yeah. that doesn't necessarily make you trust God. It might make you fear God in a pretty unhealthy right. way. But is it is this what you're trying to tell me? Yeah, that, that's exactly what okay, I'm well, getting at. Okay, well, thanks for doing the show. We'll see you next okay, week. Okay, all right. <laughs> Let's play the outro music, <laughs> and uh, we're good. Okay. But, good. Okay, but there is one thing. There is one thing in the Old Testament, and this is ultimately, I think, where we're headed, right? There is one thing in the Old Testament where we do get a sense of that imputation, where God says, uh, this is the thing, and I name you then as one of my own. The big cut. The big cut, yes. Yes. Circumcision. The snip. Yes. Yes. I mean, so to be circumcised in the Old Testament is to be one of God's people to be named as one of God's people, that God makes you. Uh, we can even go so far as to say to be circumcised is to be converted. Yes, right? Yeah. yeah. This is the sign of the covenant, and it places you under the covenant. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's not just a sign. It's a sign and a seal that uh, God Ooh. seals you with. Yeah, yeah. Right? I like that. Sign and a seal. Yeah. Did you come up with that on your own? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I invented Did that you? myself. Yeah, back Sh- about 500 years ago. I Should I know that, those I words? <laughs> okay, wow. All right. But I like I like them. I probably should know them from somewhere, shouldn't I? Uh, well, actually, um, the Calvinists are much more into that than we are, as far as that statement. But still. Okay. Yeah, but, but God not just gives us the sign uh, with the circumcision, but he gives us the seal. You know, the promise is passed on to you through this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now, very few people in Scripture, a couple, but very few, actually have circumcised themselves. Wow, Abraham, I think did, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, Ooh, I don't know. Yeah, but usually this is something done to you as an infant, and uh, you know. So once again, you have no say in the matter. Okay, you are placed yeah. under the covenant. And you were brought into the covenant by God through the hands of a moil, mm-hmm. a snipper. Uh, he's got a handy collection of cigar cigar cutters. And um, is that what they are really? It just uh... I don't know. I've never okay. seen one up close and personal. Okay. Never really wanted to. Okay. Um, good. Good. So yeah. anyway, um, you know, and and then we find in Colossians two that there's a correlation between baptism and circumcision. And that's awfully oh. handy that you have that thing that's done to you at eight days with yeah. circumcision. Yeah. And so the church is always baptized at eight days traditionally. And so there's this correlation that this happens to you, not necessarily by choice unless you're an adult convert. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. And so in the Old Testament, definitely there's the expectation that the believing Old Testament parents would bring their child to be circumcised at the appointed time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, too, though, equally fascinating uh, is that, uh, as you said, for adult converts, that's also made clear uh, even uh, in the book of Deuteronomy that uh, that any foreigner who wishes to be part of God's people shall also be circumcised. And that's a big commitment right there. It is, yeah. It's a scary yeah. commitment. It's a painful yeah. commitment. <laughs> But but you're totally right in the sense that it's uh, it's all outside of you. I'm feeling a little nauseous right now. Yeah, yeah. No one, thank you. I'd throw up in this trash can, but it's a wire mesh trash can. Yeah, really that would be, be that would ruin lots of stuff. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but it's so cool to see that uh, God is actually using these physical things, to, as you said, to put a sign and seal right. upon people. Yes. And, and um, in my study of Daniel chapter four. That's the thing where I ended up, that you know, because I could not see Nebuchadnezzar being circumcised. There is no record of that. Matter of fact, at the end of the chapter, he just vanishes, and the next chapter begins with his son. Uh, but there's no record of being circumcised, so I couldn't tell if Nebuchadnezzar was a true believer or not. Well, um, we read in the Old Testament about... Um those who who believed in the one true God who weren't necessarily part of the tribe. Um, who were those? Uh, those of the order of Melchizedek, or, you know, that sort of thing. Well, and we aren't given much detail, but these are God-fearing individuals, and 
Even some have speculated that Melchizedek is pre-incarnate Christ. I think that's a lot of speculation, but... Um, well, the the book of uh, Hebrews, right, names him as a type of Christ. Right. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, we we believe in types yeah. throughout the Bible. So Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. So anyway, you know, there were those who were not of the tribe that God had always held in reserve. He always had a he always had a bullpen it seems. Oh sure. Well, I mean you get the early chapters of Genesis without a doubt. I mean the word is passed along from generation to generation. Sure. I mean uh, Noah is not a descendant of Abraham and yet he's counted as righteous because of his faith. Um uh you get uh, Adam and Eve and their kids, right? They've got to be passing the word along. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but still, even the Word comes from outside of us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, mm-hmm. we find that he believes in the one true God, but we aren't sure that he believes in the one true God for him. Is that a fair way of saying it? You know, I, I uh, yeah, cause we, we, yeah, it's it's really good. I I, I got to hedge it a little bit by saying I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar believes in the one true God. He believes in God Most High. Oh, good point. Uh, yeah. I, so I got to hedge that just a little bit, but uh, is yeah, but the other part is dead spot on. That I don't know if he believes in the God. No, no, I will say this: I don't see any evidence that he believes in the God for him. So, in in oh, there we go. In his world. Perhaps, according to what you might be thinking here, is that Nebuchadnezzar sees Yahweh as a god who will kick you in the can if you misbehave, but not necessarily as a god of love and grace. Well, yeah, and that would actually really fit in with his... uh, Hey, Lou, how you doing? Can they hear Lou, I wonder, right now, Barton? I don't know, it's hard to say. But anyway, so... um, that would definitely fit in with uh, his pagan mythology, right? Or his pagan, his pagan religion, that you you pay these gods uh, heavy duties, uh, heavy taxes, if you will. Yeah, sure. So that they won't just beat you around. Yeah. So you go you throw ha- a virgin yeah. in the volcano and yeah. and uh, you know burn some grain oh. offerings. And oh man. Give some cows. And- yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the god who has to be appeased is vastly different than the God who offers you his mercy. Right. Yeah. Right. And and that's every other God, pretty much. I, I know I know of no gods except yeah. for Yahweh, who is yeah. a God of mercy. You know, all the other gods are very angry, and they demand an awful lot of you to not kill you and your family, sure. basically. Yeah. That, that's even the same picture that we create of the biblical God in our own minds sometimes, isn't it? Yes, and that's tragic. Yeah, because, uh, you know, for one, he's not a God that you negotiate with in the first place. I mean, he who? pretty... Yeah. Yahweh. God God does not make... No, I, I didn't mean like who. I meant like who. Oh, That was I more see. like I should have made it clear. I should have articulated yeah, that. Yeah, see, you really confused who? me with that. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now I'm just lost. Uh, uh, you're not... <laughs> whatever you said... Uh, um, you're not negotiating with, with yeah, yeah. Yes. He's he's not in the negotiating biz. He he doesn't do all of the things that the other gods that of our imagination do. You know, he he, he just saves you, yeah. and you got to you got to deal with. I've talked about this several times before. My my buddy Mark Jason, who's a pastor out in California, does campus yeah. ministry, and uh, I just love this so much that uh, he's talking to some kid on campus. And he says, Jesus is your Savior. And the kid says, I don't want him to be my Savior. He says, it's too late. He already did it. You know, yeah. He just is. That's all there is to it. You know, and, and there's no negotiating here. You know, it's, mm-hmm. He's your Savior. That's plain and simple. Yeah. And if you insist on not having him to be your Savior, you, you, you can have your, your way, but he still died for you. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Because you know, that's what he does. Right. Oh, uh, Martin Luther. The love of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. Yes. Yeah. Rod Rosenblatt. God provides everything that he demands. Ooh. That's, that's pretty awesome. good, huh? That, that is really good. I think he probably stole that from someone else, like Luther, but I'm not sure. Still. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it's, that is really good news, that God actually provides 
everything that he demands because he demands perfection. He demands yeah. nothing short of complete and utter righteousness, things that we can't conjure up. And then he says, here, I've given you my son. I've provided yeah. it for you. Mm-hmm. It's pretty awesome. It is supremely awesome. Well, we are pretty much out of time. We'll, we'll come back around to this a little bit next program. And we'll talk a little bit more about the concrete nature of the gospel and what that means for you. So, get a little out music here. Oh, yes. Wow. Feeling the aloha. Yes. Hey, be sure to uh, subscribe to this program. iTunes, Spreaker, Podbean, Spotify. Man, I want a Mai Tai. It's really just... Want to go sit out on the lawn, soak up some rays? Pirate Christian Radio, Friday mornings. Email us, 200proofgospel at gmail.com. Give us some good reviews, because we have big egos, and uh, we like to have our egos fed. So wherever you (laughs) get your podcast, say we're awesome, and uh, then our heads will swell, and we'll feel good about ourselves. Validated. Validated. Yeah. Aloha, Troy. Aloha. (laughs) 